Mr. Thompson, please report to the principal's office immediately. Would Mr. Dunn please proceed to the principal's office now? Hmm. Wonder what that's about. Oh! Are you called down to the office as well? Yeah, what's this for? I don't know. Did you put the six secrets away in the vault from episode two? I told you I did. You haven't been hacking into the mainframe again like you did in our math episode. Oh. Set off the alarm system. That wasn't me. You're the one who tripped the alarms. Could it be? Oh no. The marshmallow explosion. This is gonna take long. The waiting is killing me. Man, it's like they make us wait on purpose to... To make us think about everything that we've done wrong. Man, is it hot in here or is it just me? Just you. Thanks for coming. Do you know why you're here? It seems your children are spending less time watching TV and playing video games now. It was all his idea. They are also, let me see here, excited about and engaged with your classes. That was never, ever our intention. You're co-creating lessons with your colleagues? Listen, I... Just met him. We, we don't even know each other's middle names. Nice Clayton, by the way. You're scaffolding using differentiated instruction and you're collaborating with students to create anchor charts? Are we in trouble here? What I really like to know is what are your learning goals for today's episode? Is that what this is about? This whole episode is about teaching and learning board games and selecting success criteria. We want to show teachers how to select, learn, and prepare to use board games in their classroom effectively. We don't just want teachers to play their games with their students. We want them to teach them and use them as tools with their students. We want, student, we want teachers to know what to do before, during, and after teaching the board game. And what is your success criteria for this episode? One million hits. Wow, that sounds really great. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, I have to admit, I thought this was about the marshmallow explosion. What marshmallow incident? Welcome to episode 7 of Two Geeks in a Game, our teaching and learning uh, episode which we're filming during the summer, which is uh, a lot of fun. Uh, today's goal is to teach teachers how to use board games in their classrooms effectively, making sure that they go through the three stages of looking at the board game before, looking at how the students are using the board game during the activity, and then how to use that activity afterwards for further furthering the learning of students. Some of you might be calling that for, as, and of learning. Doesn't matter what you call it, it's the same thing. First of all, I think it's really critical that you understand how to play the game yourself. And to do that, I think you need to play it with family and friends. They'll enjoy this game just as much as your students will. Uh, I would also recommend you play it with staff and colleagues if you have a chance at a PD session or at a meeting, I mean, fire it up or invite them over to your place to get to know these games before you introduce them in the class. Lastly, I would also um, just play these games with your students and you can create a culture of uh, community and caring uh, just by inviting students into your room at lunch to play it, having a board game club, and I think you did that at your high school, you had a thriving club. Yeah, absolutely, and there's actually another thing that you can do as well. 
Uh, it's maybe a little off the mainstream, but uh, in episode 8 of uh, Two Geeks in a Game, I'll be going to uh, the Dice Tower Con in Orlando, Florida, and uh, I'm going to show you how maybe going to a convention is a great way of learning new games that you might not have accessed otherwise. Absolutely. So why don't we get started right away with uh, the before stage. This is when you're just pulling out the game and it's absolutely critical first to know the game but second that you engage your students with the game. And there's lots of different strategies you can use to engage them. Uh, so we have two games here for you today. I'm going to focus on before, during and after with King of Tokyo. And I'm going to do before, during and after of the very different game Robinson Crusoe by very different, very different from King of Tokyo. That's right, so my hook for this game, I would start, I mean there's an obvious connection right now, is Godzilla. Uh, there's the most recent remake of it, and uh, the, the, I mean the, the teaching value in that is that the monster movie is essentially an allegory of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima came out just uh, after that, and uh, this game, if, if maybe you don't want to get into that right away, but why not start with a film clip? Or maybe you could do some writing about the monsters ahead of time, create a story, or, or read a story that has, features a monster in it. Uh, there's innumerable ways, but the essential thing is that you find a way to interest your students in this game so they want to play it. Don't just throw it at them and expect them to want to play it without ever having heard anything about it. With Robinson Crusoe, you might be reading the book. Uh, maybe you watched the film Castaways. Uh, maybe you're just interested in uh, survival as a, as a genre or a theme. Uh, that's a, a great book. That's right. You also need to create learning goals for your students, and we're going to divide this into two types of learning goals. There's the, the goal within the game, we'll call this the success criteria, where you need to tell the students ultimately what is it that they're trying to do. In this game, you're trying to destroy all the other monsters or get to 20 victory points. In Robinson Crusoe, there is uh, different scenarios with different success criteria, but basically in each one, you were trying to survive till the end of the game. That's right. It's nice and simple. It's one sentence. This is what you want to do. There's lots of ways to get there. But uh, I think the, the second phase of this is what do you as a teacher want your students to learn? Why this game and why not Monopoly? Or why a game at all? Exactly. Why any game and, and how can you use that? So uh, for this game I would say that um, I'm actually surprised because normally I'm the one showing the cooperative games, but today Mr. Dunn has a cooperative game. Uh, the reason I like this one is the interaction in the game between students, but also you can subtly infuse literacy into it. They're trying to read the cards to create a customized plan to their own victory. So there's some strategy going on there, and I think it's really interesting for them to uh, see how they can create their own way to victory. Whereas with uh, many cooperative games, the learning goal for Robinson Crusoe is going to be having that collaborative inquiry, uh, that culture of solving a problem as a group rather than as an individual. But at the same time, Robinson Crusoe works very well if somebody does emerge as a leader, mm -hmm. being that leader person, but in a positive role rather than that negative leader bully which we talked about in our pandemic episode. That's right. And as you said before, a student who doesn't really understand the game can lean on a student and learn from and model after a student who really gets the game. And they can still be completely immersed in the environment that you've created and they're going to get that great learning that you've been working very hard at trying to get. Absolutely. It's also critical that you use student-friendly language, so don't throw out all the language that students don't really understand. Put it in terms they understand. So this is what you're doing, and this is why you're doing it. Make it very clear that uh, it's not just playing the game, it's also learning from the game. And right on that point, that gets to the first thing you want to do when you're preparing for the game beforehand. You need the students to know the rules, and if you look at the rule book for Robinson Crusoe, it's quite a weighty tone. Whereas, it's basically a pamphlet for King of Tokyo, and the approaches to this are very different. I think with King of Tokyo, how would you have the students learn the... I would do this actually a little bit subvers subversively. I would um, tell the students I'm busy and I need to help somebody else with whatever I've created, and, uh, and I would give them the very small rules and say, here, give, give it a shot, guys. Here's the basic idea of what you have to do, but if you could just figure out the, the details on your own, that'd be excellent, so you're supporting literacy that way. Whereas, with, with a tome like this, I don't think I would go that route. The students are going to be frustrated by the time they've gotten to the end of the first page. Yeah. And they're going to be pushing it away, they're not going to be engaged, and the whole point behind this has been lost. So instead, 
you need to teach them the rules. And hopefully Two Geeks in the Game will be able to help you with that. Uh, one of our plans is to have uh, playthroughs and uh, lesson uh, episodes. So one of them could be for Robinson Crusoe. That's right. And there's lots of resources online where you can learn games. Rather run through, you've mentioned that one. Yeah. Uh, he's excellent at just giving a quick overview of the game. But as a teacher, if you already know the game, then you can teach it to them fairly quickly. And then, then the engagement happens first and not the frustration. So Now what about, uh, what's the during phase about? Yeah, the during phase, it, it's a tricky phase to, for us to talk about because I'm looking for seizable teaching opportunities. And uh, playing with him, I, I've learned a lot about this because when you see something happening where a student doesn't understand, that's where you as a teacher jump in and try and get them past that obstacle. And it's not that you're playing the game for them, it's that whole idea of scaffolding. If they're not understanding something, that's where you're able to teach them. And that's where they're going to be learning because they have demonstrated an immediate need. But I think the dur during stage as well is a really good idea, a good opportunity, I should say, to reinforce the goals that you had outlined in the before stage. Are you winning the game? Are you doing the activity that I want you to do? Are you working collaboratively? Or are you losing this game because you're all trying to do your own thing and not listening to each other? And that's why this has turned into a shambles. And that's not a bad thing because now it can be, so what do we learn from this? That's right. So you really need to emphasize positive collaboration and communication because sometimes you will get people um, who are really nasty when they play the game. Use that as a chance to say, listen, let's, let's try and avoid those types of interactions and let's focus on doing this. How could we reword that so that you don't offend uh, the player that you just completely wiped out of the game? And that's not just in cooperative games like you just mentioned, that's in interactive games as well. There is good winners and bad winners. Right. We've all met both. Yeah, important to be a good winner and to teach those skills and, and to be a good loser. It's okay to lose the game and I think that's fine to teach your students that. The, the key though, I think for the during phase is that as a teacher you need to be monitoring, you need to be there, you need to know what the students are doing and you need to keep guiding them in the direction that you want them to ultimately go in. You don't want to win the game for them, you don't want to lose the game for them, but you want to make sure that they are immersed and engaged in the experience. Absolutely. Let's move to our final stage. This is the of stage or the after stage of learning uh, where you digest what's happened in the game. I think this is a great time to reflect on successes and challenges that you faced in the game and also places that you would try to improve. So if you, if you just end the game, great, you won, okay, we're done. Um, that might be fine if your singular goal is engagement. But if you're looking for learning opportunities, then let's break the games down a little bit. Well, and even just as you were saying that, it sounds so flat. Okay, we're done, pack up the game and let's go home. You've wasted all of the hard work that you've built up to this point. I mean, this is really the opportunity for you to evaluate the students. They've now done an activity and now you can talk to them about it. You can have them uh, write something, uh, just to discuss something, maybe even uh, produce some other sort of work related to that, to that activity and from that you're going to be able to see how much did they really learn from that activity. That's right. You can also validate your own learning here. So if you started, like I suggested, with Godzilla, a clip from that movie, then now you can go back and compare what, what did we find that was similar. Now let's go and write our own script for our own film. You might use this in a film studies class, a media studies class. You could use it in drama. Okay, we're going to get into character and uh, create our own script based around, you know, we could uh, create a play or um, there's all... It, the reason that we're discussing this game today is because it's not just for English or drama or French or whatever course you're going to use it in. Um, the methodology is the same for all of the courses. You just change the content to suit what you're doing. And in our English, English episode, we mentioned Robinson Crusoe. It's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up today. We talked about a writing activity, and ever since we mentioned that, I've been thinking so much about that. Now, I don't teach English, so I don't get that opportunity very often. But the whole idea of setting up this environment, this very immersive environment, I mean the students work together to succeed at certain goals and be pushed back by obstacles and have to readjust what their goals are along the way so that they can sort of meet their immediate needs rather than just their long-term needs. All of that is great. So then during it, I'm going to be talking to them about making sure they remember what it was that they were working on in the sequence of events. 
And then afterwards, well, for the debrief, I might have them write some journal entries. Maybe if it was a drama type course, I might have them act out a particularly uh, thrilling set of sequences. Uh, you know, somebody's bitten by a snake, but nobody's interested in finding the cure. What did the people say to each other when they were on the island that it was like, well, you were bitten by a snake, but we're not going to bother finding you medicine or anything like that. I can't imagine that that was a very easy conversation. But they as a group decided on it, and maybe they succeeded because of that decision. That's right. You might also consider for King of Tokyo doing an exit card. So at the end of the game, um, you say, okay, I want you to write down three moments where you saw some really positive interaction, or maybe two moments of that, one moment where you saw a strategy that led to victory, and I'd like you also to reflect on one moment that you would change or one that you weren't, uh, you didn't feel as comfortable with in the game if you know somebody said something that, that bothered you. Um, so that way you could do a very quick summary um, and just, just to really consolidate the game. Yeah, and that's the whole idea with the after is it's consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. That's right. So in a, we have three sub-episodes that will be connected to this one. Uh, for, we're, we're calling it Dunn's Corner. And uh, so we're going to focus on scaffolding, differentiated instruction, and how to use anchor charts and learning supports in your classes. And there'll be links at the end of this uh, video to all three of those. That's right. And I guess episode eight will feature Mr. Dunn's road trip to the convention so you can actually see uh, how as a teacher you can uh, develop your own knowledge of these games. It was pretty tough traveling to Orlando on assignment. That's right. It was really tough. And uh, we'll also have a, a guest appearing in that episode. Tom Vassell is joining us for an interview then, so we're very happy to have him on board. Yes, and for those of you who don't know who Tom Vassell are, um, you can move out from underneath your rock now. He is probably the biggest board game reviewer in the world. Uh, not to diss anybody else, but he has definitely put in his time to earn that title. And I was fortunate enough to ask him some questions. You may notice I'm a little choked up. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, hero worship there while I was uh, interviewing him. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us for this episode. Don't forget to uh, join us Twitter, Facebook. And subscribe to this yep. channel. Check out the Board Game Geek too. We have a guild going on there. Yeah. And teaching rules. It certainly does. Man, is it hot in here or is it just me? You gotta put that in there, though. <laughs> I killed the whole take! <laughs> or is it just me? Just you. <laughs> One more time. Just you? I gotta do it. I'll do it without saying anything. Yeah. Just you.